Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Saeed Malami and I'm the student coordinator for the Mill series. Tonight we welcome Coleman Hughes. Coleman is a student of philosophy at Columbia University who has, since mid-2018, become an emerging critical voice in race matters in the United States when his first article for Quillette was published. Since then, he has written a great deal more for Quillette and has been featured on several podcasts like Sam Harris's show and The Rubin Report. Tonight, he will be speaking on um, race in America. Please join me in welcoming Coleman Hughes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, real, it's an honor to be here at Lafayette for the Mill series. Uh, I have to apologize in advance. I, uh, I have a cold. I woke up yesterday with an itch in my throat that has since blossomed into a full-blown experience. So if I seem low energy, it's not you, it's me, okay? So uh, when Russia waged its social media campaign to destabilize American politics in 2016, they targeted one demographic group more than any other. It could have been Democrats or Republicans. It wasn't, wasn't Antifa, wasn't the alt-right, it wasn't Christians, it wasn't Muslims. It was black people. Now, I think this is no accident. I think race is arguably America's most divisive issue, and I think our foreign enemies know that. But I doubt I need to persuade you that the American public is divided on race. You need only turn on the news or more likely check social media to see the latest scandal. Last week, it was Jesse Smollett's fabricated hate crime. A week before, it was Governor Ralph Northam's yearbook photo depicting one man in blackface and another in a KKK costume. A few weeks earlier, it was the weatherman who got tongue-tied on air and seemed to utter a racial slur. Uh, sometimes the scandals uh, are longer. They last months or years, as with the case of the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter uh, debacle. Either way, the pattern is the same. Some event with, with racial overtones occurs. One half of the politi political spectrum, and it varies, uh, has a meltdown, and the other half has an equal and opposite meltdown. Uh, both sides think each other are completely crazy. Um, but I I'm not going to discuss the specific scandals today. Uh, instead, I'm going to present what I believe is the fundamental disagreement that's playing itself out in our culture over and over again in microcosm. At bottom, I think we're experiencing a clash between two visions, two different ways of orienting yourself philosophically towards the issue of race. And I should note here that I I'm drawing heavily on the work of a critical race theorist named Gary Peller, who I have a lot of disagreements with, but who is who is been more useful than anyone I know in drawing the, the distinction between these two visions. So the verse, first vision is what I call the humanist vision. This is the vision held by Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, A. Philip Randolph, and other civil rights leaders. And it's advocated today by writers like Thomas Sowell, John McWhorter, Glenn Lowry, Adolph Reed, and many more. The central claim of the humanist vision is that racism <coughs> primarily should be understood as the opposite of reason. Attributing meaning to the amount of melanin in someone's skin is a kind of logical error in this, in this vision. Uh, therefore, it's equally irrational to hate all black people, to hate all white people, or all Asians. These are all seen as variations of the same mistake. Right? To be prejudiced against anyone because of their color is to have an irrational belief. And to discriminate against a, a person for that reason is to act out your own irrationality. So that's the first vision. The second vision is what I call the anti-racist vision. This was the vision held by Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and the Black Power Movement. And it's the vision articulated today by <coughs> ta Coates, Ibram Kendi, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and many others. The fundamental principle of the anti-racist vision is that the meaning of racism is based in the historical power relations of a particular society or a particular country. In this vision, your skin color is not meaningless. Rather, it's injected with meaning by history and by the particular history of the society you live in. And because racial power relations in American history have been asymmetrical, it's been almost entirely white suppressing blacks, 
therefore, the meaning of racism today is also asymmetrical, which is to say that a, a black person hating white people is not the same as a white person hating black people, because you can't abstract away from American history and speak of racism as if it had a kind of universal or objective meaning. Um, the best analogy I can think of to capture the difference between these two visions, and it is a fundamental difference, uh, is weight. Before you ever took a physics class, you probably assumed, like most people, that every object has a fixed objective weight in, measured in pounds or kilograms uh, that didn't change based on where that object is located in the universe. Then you took intro physics and learned that there's no such thing as the objective weight of an object. It's a meaningless question to ask. Rather, objects only have a weight in virtue of the particular planet they're on and the amount of gravity on that planet. What they do have is an objective mass that doesn't change wherever, right? So that's, that's an analogy. Uh, for the humanist vision, racism is a departure from neutral reason. It's an objective concept like mass. For the anti-racist vision, the meaning of racism is embedded in the history of a particular society, much like an object's weight is grounded in the amount of gravity on a particular planet. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> let me give a concrete example of uh, example of each vision from famous thinkers in each tradition. <coughs> Martin Luther King said, black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. And God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race, unquote. Now notice the ethical symmetry here between white racism and black racism. King obviously would never deny that the power of, of white racism had absolutely dwarfed the power of black racism in American society. That goes without saying. But both kinds of racism are equally irrational in, in, the, in, in the sense that they depart from the humanist ethic, right? And now an example from uh, the most famous living thinker in the anti-racist tradition, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Now here, Coates is commenting on the ethics of gentrification, the process by which white people enter an all or mostly black neighborhood, change the culture, change the mix of businesses, etc. cetera. Uh, it'll probably come as no surprise that Coates believes gentrification is evil, a manifestation of white supremacy. I think the exact quote is, but a more pleasing name for, for white supremacy. Uh, but I like to, I'd like you to pay attention to why he believes this. Right, here, here's what he says, quote, the notion that Washington DC should remain black has always struck me as really bizarre. Very little in America ever stays anything. Change is the nature of things. It only makes sense if you buy that black people are owed something. That is, since we never got anything for slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, blockbusting, segregation, housing, and job discrimination, we at least deserve the stability of neighborhoods and cities we can call home. Unquote. So this is the anti-racist vision in its purest form. Notice the thinking here, right? But for the history of white racism, he argues, it would be crazy to single out black people for special treatment, right? Instead, the rationale for singling us out for special treatment is precisely the fact that we used to get singled out for especially bad treatment. This shows you the degree to which history and, and the contingent history of American society is a central principle of the anti-racist vision. So now that I've um, <clears throat> explained the fundamental difference between the two visions, I want to caution against a few misunderstandings. First, the difference between humanist vision and the anti-racist vision ultimately has nothing to do with political left and right or with economics. In the humanist tradition, you have left-wing socialists like Bayard Rustin, who was a communist in his early days. Adolf Reed, another socialist, but you also have free market conservatives like Thomas Sowell. Uh, likewise, in the anti-racist tradition, there are left-wing progressives like ta Coates and social conservatives like Malcolm X in his early days, or uh, Elijah Muhammad. Uh, secondly, I've been speaking as if there's a perfectly clear boundary between these two visions, such that everyone falls on one side or the other, but as is usually the case, it's, it's not quite that simple. It's less of a binary and more of a spectrum. Uh, but it's still, it's a spectrum with two very powerful centers of gravity. 
uh, in the same way that you can identify black and white on a color wheel without being able to identify the exact row of pixels that separates one from the other, you can identify the, the basic structure of the two visions without being able to place every person uh, into one camp or the other. <coughs> and thirdly, these visions are generally held implicitly rather than explicitly, by which I mean uh, many people hold the humanist vision as a kind of gut feeling, but couldn't really tell you its principles. Likewise, many people hold the anti-racist vision as a kind of gut feeling, but couldn't state its principles, principles explicitly. The assumptions of each vision are almost never articulated in our national race debate. Uh, yet, this doesn't make the visions any less powerful. In fact, just the opposite. It's precisely the fact that the assumptions are never made explicit that makes the vision seem so obvious to those who hold them and, and so obviously wrong to those who don't. So till now, I've been, I've been presenting a kind of neutral analysis of both visions, but I'm going to come out of hiding here and say that I am a partisan on behalf of the humanist vision. I think the anti-racist vision is a disaster intellectually, politically, and ethically. And uh, unfortunately, it seems to be on the rise. If you doubt that it's on the rise, uh, consider this. <clears throat> the, quote, uh, excuse me. the quote from ta Coates that I gave you earlier, uh, that came from an addendum to his essay, The Case for Reparations. That essay, many of you will, will probably know, was published five years ago. <laughs> And it was a kind of long-form plea for Americans to grapple with the role of slavery, Jim Crow, uh, redlining, uh, in the creation of the racial wealth gap, the staggering racial wealth gap between blacks and whites. His essay really electrified the nation. Uh, it uh, launched him to permanent intellectual stardom and provoked a heated debate amongst critics. But there's one fact that was uni universally agreed upon by Coates, by his critics, uh, by his defenders, and that was uh, none of us expected to see reparations on the platform of a mainstream uh, presidential candidate anytime soon. The thinking was that Coates could afford to make the case for reparations because he's a writer and a truth teller and a gadfly, but a politician trying to win over uh, America's race-shy electorate would be committing, <laughs> committing political suicide uh, if they attempted to do the same thing. Last week, we were all proven wrong, I, I would argue. Uh, Elizabeth Warren just endorsed reparations for slavery. Uh, Kamala Harris said she supports reparations. Uh, but in her case, she seems to have her own private definition of the term, namely any anti-poverty policy. And that's, that's particularly interesting to me, right? Because what Kamala, when pressed, supports is not reparations. It's just policy to help the poor. Um, but she still felt, when, like, when confronted that, uh, I'm doing a bit of mind reading here, I'll, I'll acknowledge, but she couldn't just say no to reparations in the way that Bernie Sanders did, for example, um, even though their policies are equally race neutral. My point is this. Five years ago, even ta Coates' most passionate admirers believed that it would be political suicide for any candidate to endorse reparations for slavery. Now, apparently, we have a mainstream candidate like Kamala Harris who thinks it's political suicide not to endorse reparations for slavery. And all of this, mind you, in a country that, according to Coates, remains fundamentally and essentially white supremacist. Um, e even before the anti-racist vision broke into mainstream politics, uh, it had al already really swept through the culture in ways that don't often get talked about. One rather amazing indicator of this fact, uh, rather amazing to me, is that black first names and white first names have massively diverged uh, in the post-civil rights era. Indeed, precisely the era in which racism has declined. In the late 1960s, the typical black woman living in a segregated neighborhood had a first name that was only twice as common among blacks as among whites. 10 years later, the typical black woman living in a segregated area had a name that was 20 times as common among blacks as among whites. The uh, Harvard economist that discovered this fact attributed the tenfold increase in the uh, rate of name divergence to the influence of the black power movement, 
Stokely Carmichael, Rat Brown, um, Nation of Islam, the sense that black people's true home was Africa, uh, our true religion was Islam, so that Stokely, for example, renamed himself Kwame Ture. And uh, now we, ha we feel as if it's a stereotype at this point, uh, commonly known that if you, if you hear someone's name is Tyrone, you think, oh, this is a black person. That's an authentic black name. Uh, virtually unheard of as of 1960. So this is the power of, of the anti-racist vision. Uh, and it's the power of ideas to permeate a culture whether or not they um, uh, influence politics. And last thing I'll say about that is uh, often, you know, if you read the New York Times or you read really any mainstream newspaper, you will find uh, these audit studies often reported where, you, you know, black candidate, white candidate sends out a job application with a typically black name, typically white name. W without exception, the black names get a lower rate of response. And uh, this is adduced as a kind of evidence for why we need the anti-racist vision. Uh, although, ironically, that very phenomenon is largely enabled by the legacy of the anti-racist vision. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, coincident with the rise of the anti-racist vision has been an attack on the humanist vision. And there are two main objections to the humanist vision. Uh, one is that the anti-racist vision is, is necessary because of systemic racism, uh, police violence, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, the racial wealth gap. Uh, how are we going to address this if not a bold kind of anti-racism that seeks to, as Coates once put it, directly redress history, right? And I, I'm going to leave the specifics of that objection for the q and A. I'm I'm expecting there will be questions relating to systemic racism, um, perhaps police violence or mass incarceration. So I, I'm going to leave that for the Q&A. Uh, but I will say one thing here, which is that the humanist vision was the vision that got black people civil rights in this country. Really, the best thing you can say about the black power movement, Nation of Islam, is that, and, and uh, you know, prominent civil rights leaders like Bayard Rustin acknowledge this, um, is that it, they scared the hell out of white people so thoroughly that it drove more white people into the hands of the humanist vision. Um, they said, essentially, if, if that's what you're offering, if you're offering a kind of uh, violent, militant, separatist ideology, I'll take the nonviolent one. So uh, frankly, if the humanist vision was good enough for Dr. King, it's good enough for me. And you can absolutely combat uh, systemic racism. You can absolutely combat police violence. You can absolutely uh, form policy to reduce the number of people that are incarcerated without buying the principles of, of the anti-racist vision. None of that is entailed. It was not entailed for Dr. King, nor, nor is it entailed for us. And the second objection um, is that the, the humanist vision is a kind of naive attempt at colorblindness. Um, there's a, the, the idea being that uh, the history of America has not been colorblind. You can't just fire the starting gun now and say, right now we're going to start treating everyone as individuals when you haven't been doing that for centuries. Right? That is no kind of justice. That's the objection. Right? And we're seeing this. This is, not, this is no longer um, just a, a view that academics uh, throw at each other. Right? This is completely seeped into the culture at this point. I could give many examples. Uh, I'll just give one from the past month, although there are several just from the past month. Uh, this one was just particularly sharp. Bernie Sanders. Bernie, Sh Bernie Sanders said, quote, a couple days ago, I think. We have got to look at candidates, you know, not by the color of their skin, not by their sexual orientation or their gender, or not by their age. I mean, I think we have got to try to move toward a non-discriminatory society which looks at people based on their abilities, based on what they stand for. So this is basically a direct, uh, almost plagiarism of Dr. King. A everything Bernie Sanders said there including the fact that you should not vote for a politician based on their race, are explicitly things Dr. King said. For this, he was ridiculed. Uh, Stephen Colbert mockingly said, quote, 
Yes, like Dr. King, I have a dream, a dream where this diverse nation can come together and be led by an old white guy. Um, I, I highly doubt he would have said that if it were Dr. King saying it. But um, the, the point being that at this point, at least on the cultural and political left, it is taboo. It is taboo to quote Dr. King. Um, <clears throat> My, my, my response to the colorblindness objection is, you know, the, the objection goes that because of the asymmetry of history, we can't be colorblind now. But it is in fact our failure to have been colorblind in the past that caused the very historical injustices that now motivate the anti-racist vision to then adopt policies that impose racial double standards and then give new groups reasons to feel grievances, right? It is setting yourself up for a perpetual motion machine of grievance. Um, let me give one example of this. Uh, forget about whites and blacks for a moment and focus on Asians. Um, uh, Japanese people in this country in 13 or 14 different states were not allowed to own property until 1952 when the Supreme Court ruled that they could I'm sure all of you are familiar with the internment camps, over 100,000 Japanese interned. My point is not that uh, Japanese have had it nearly as bad as blacks have it, had, had it in this country. It's not my point. My point is that they ha have had it much, much harder uh, than whites, historically, right? So this is a case where the anti-racist vision, where racism is embedded in history, should be saying, logically, that we should be giving some kind of, if not explicit, then... Um, implicit kind of reparations for Asians. And although uh, uh, the specific Japanese who were interned, the, the, who were literally interned, they did get reparations in, in I believe, the 1980s. As a group, uh, we do not treat Asian Americans uh, particularly well in this country. Uh, you need only look at affirmative action and the Harvard case. Uh, but we've, it's nothing new. We've known this for years. 2009, the uh, Princeton sociologist Thomas Espenshade found that uh, identical re uh, an, an Asian uh, applicant to, to an elite school had to score several hundred points higher, something like 400 SAT points higher than a black student, and uh, some, somewhere in the vicinity of 200 points, one or 200 points higher than, than a white student, right? So relative to whites, Asians are discriminated against. And I'll, I'll never forget a New York Times editorial from several months ago, which described Asian families in New York who, quote, scrimped on essentials like food to pay for test prep, end quote. I'll never forget that quote, because the article was framed in such a way so as to justify a policy of, of discrimination. Um, this is what I mean when I say the attempt to redress history uh, ends up creating more injustices, more racial injustices, that yet call for more, uh, uh, um, more reparations in, in a broad sense of the term. Um, which, which brings me to my central, my central problem with the anti-racist vision is that there's, there's just a zero-sum conflict between justice for individuals, for living individuals, flesh and blood, blood humans, and justice for abstract intertemporal groups. There's, there's no way to reconcile those two um, concepts. Uh, the idea that we're seriously entertaining reparations for slavery, which would put money in my pocket and presumably not in the pocket of a poor white family uh, or a poor Asian family, uh, that, that only makes sense if you have this outsized place, this outsized role for the contingent history of the United States in your current ethical system. But ethical principles cannot be they, 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 they can't just be contingent on the, the particular history of a country because we'll never get out of this. So uh, to paraphrase one of my favorite writers, Thomas Sowell, we currently live in a society where babies are born with a set of ready-made grievances against other babies born the same day. Uh, the anti-racist vision, in my view, is a recipe for remaining in this condition. And the humanist vision is the only way out. Thank you.